Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. The story of Daniel Boone. Adapted for radio from material suggested by the distinguished American author, Marquis James. Starring John McIntyre in the role of Daniel Boone. The DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, present the Cavalcade of America, dedicated to those men and women in every walk of life who have shaped the destiny of America in the past, and to the youth of today who will shape the destiny of America in the future. Our story tonight is Daniel Boone. Our star is John McIntyre, whose voice you have heard on many of radio's leading programs. On the Cavalcade of America, he has notably portrayed the role of Andrew Jackson, presenting John McIntyre in the story of Daniel Boone. In the year 1819, an artist named Chester Harding made his way through the wilderness of Middle America to a place some 200 miles up the Missouri River from St. Louis. There, coming upon a small cabin in a clearing, he was to paint a portrait of the great American frontiersman, Daniel Boone. Well, good morning, mister. Good morning, ma'am. Could you tell me where I could find Colonel Daniel Boone? Why, sure. Colonel Boone's my grandpet. What would you be wanting of him, mister? Well, ma'am, I'm an artist. Everybody back east has heard of Daniel Boone. When I heard he was out here in Missouri, I set off to find him. It's taken me over three months to get here. But if he let me paint his picture, it'll be worth it. <laughs> well, mister, the hard time you'll have of it if you hanker to paint his likeness. His head do wobble like to roll off on his shoulders. And he'll talk you into an early grave. With but I'll have my young'uns lead you to him. Jimmy? Yes, Ma? Becky? You want us, Ma? Come here. Who'll be the stranger, Ma? Now, don't be questioning. Leave the stranger to your grandpa and be quick getting back, for there's chores to do. Yes, Ma. Just follow us, mister. All right. Grandpa lives over yonder hill. You be a city fellow, ain't you? Well, how did you guess that? You got store clothes on, that's how. <laughs> so, uh... Colonel Boone's your grandfather, huh? No, our great-grandpappy is. Oh. But we don't hold with fancy titles, so we just call him Grandpap. Oh. Well, there'll be Grandpap over there. What's he doing? Uh, is he ill? Oh, no, he be hale as can be. He's roasting the venison. He always lays on his back whilst roasting the venison. That's just easier on the joint. Oh, I see. Hey, Grandpap, pay some heed. Give a visitor. Well, pleased to see you, sir. I hope you ain't aiming to settle in these parts. Uh, no, uh, uh, no. Uh, I guess I'm not the settling type, Colonel Boone. Uh, good. Neither am I. Uh, where are you from, Sanji? Boston. Took a lot of riding and fording rivers and tramping afoot to come out here to find you. Uh, never knew the country was so big. Well, it's still mighty crowded for me. A fellow like me has got to have elbow room. I don't feel easy where I can look out of my cabin door and see a chimney smoking anywhere. But uh, what do you want of me, stranger? Well, Colonel Boone, I'm a painter. You don't need no painting done. Well, I've come to paint your picture. People back east have heard a lot about you, Colonel Boone. I had a hard time getting out here, and I, I want to bring them back a painting of just how you look. Uh, likeness to me? Uh, that's it, yes. Well, I'll be hanged. Then paint away, stranger. Paint away. All right. I, I'll uh, just set up my easel here. And you'll have to hold your head still, though, uh, so it'll be a good job. Yes, yes. Jimmy. Yes, Grandpa? Come on over here. Hang on to the back of my scalp so as my head don't move now. All right, Grandpa. Say, Grandpa, tell the stranger about the engines. Uh, am all right now, stranger? Fine, fine. Uh... What well, them, it? them engines, I tell you, a mighty nice parcel of friends to have. Too bad there ain't more of them around. But they had to go because the country just had to spread out, I guess. I seen it all happen. Yes, I did. Folks needed elbow room for certain. I had the wandering spirit myself. 
Back there in 75, we began to cross over the mountains into the west. King Chuck. Uh, there was freedom out there, room for a man to move about in. We wanted to get beyond the mountains and build homes where we'd have our say about how we quiet and listen. We all started out here from Carolina, strung our pack horses and wagons along over the mountains. We blazed the trail to Cane Tuck. We've been building this fort here, Boonesboro. The land we bought fair and square from the Cherokees. Now the British say we have no right to settle on it. Well, Indians were here before them. It was their land to sell and we paid for it. It belongs to us now. Right. Well, just the same, it's going to be a struggle to hold it. The British will do all they can to drive us off. They won't if we're ready for them, if we run things right. All right, that's it. What do we do, Judge Henderson? Well, we've got to have a government here at Fort Boonesboro, the first west of the mountains. And we need to run it the best we know how. Well, that's agreeable. What do we do first? Well, for one thing, somebody's got to take charge of things. Well, that aims the right way. Well, Captain Boone showed us the way out now, here. Now, wait a minute. I ain't fit for what you're thinking. All right, all right. Captain Boone, we've followed you to Cane Tuck. You did a good job leading us here. I think you're the one to give us the help we need now. Well, man, you all heard what the judge said about them British fixing to drive us out of Cane Tuck. Well, we won't let them. We'll get the stockade built. 30 horses and mules, 30 guns we got. In this wilderness, a band of men don't need no more to defend what's there. We'll take all turns watching the fort as sentries. Then, boys, we'll get down to living. For now, we've been alone out here. We need our families. Soon we'll get things fixed up, and I vote we go back and get them. And then we'll hold this settlement here at Boonesboro. <laughs> Well, Becky, we cross the Holson River. We come through Moccasin Gap and down the Clinch. It are pretty, weren't it? All the laurel and cane break. Yes, Daniel. It were pretty, but it were wild and fearsome. Well, don't worry, Becky. It's been slow going in this wagon for certain, but you and our daughter Jemima have borne it brave. I'm right proud of you. Wait. Woo, woo. There it is, Becky, down there. Down there in them valleys is the dark and bloody hunting ground. Kentucky. What's that mean, Pa? Among the meadows, daughter. That's what the Indians call it. There she is. Twenty million acres of her and all of it ours. Yes. Yes, it's fair land, Daniel. And the Indians said, brother, it's a good land, but you'll find it hard to hold. Hard to hold. Be aiming to settle down for good at Boonesboro, Daniel? Sure, I aims to, Becky. Wait till you see our fort. Becky, there ain't nothing going to stop us. We've blazed a trail out here, and we have a place to live where men aren't plagued with kings and their orders. It's a home for you and me and Jemima, Becky. A home in God's wilderness. Yes, Daniel. Is it a hard thing I'm asking of you, Rebecca? Come out here to the wilderness? Daniel, I've seen your eyes turn to the hills. I've... I've felt your yearning to be wandering. But, Daniel, remember on the words in the Bible, the words of Ruth, and treat me not to leave thee, and to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. <laughs> Everything is so fine and happy at the fort now, Daniel. 
And I think daughter Jemima is bursting joyful to be wed. Well, Flanders Calloway's a right good man, I bet. Kind of thought our Jemima looked like a happy child at the wedding. Except me to wondering if she'd have given him a cent. Percy Young. He's at 15, Dano, but I were just turned 17 when I wed you. <laughs> Rebecca. <laughs> Well, who's the bride and groom? You two or us? Oh, and... <laughs> Flanders, you goose, you. <laughs> I'm so happy for you both. Ma, you've been so kind. Oh, no, no. You all go on back to your dad. Will you do me the honor, Mrs. Calloway? Delighted, Mr. Calloway. Well, what's happened to the music? It's a runner from up the creek. Wonder what's up. Hey! Hey, just a minute! Folks, I got bad news. Ten men were scalped today over to Lickin Creek. Ten? <laughs> How many Redskins was there? I uh, can't tell, but they burned homesteads all the way from here to the valley. We've got to turn out and fix them, boys. That's right. They're headed for Boonesboro right now. Uh, we got to hurry. Come on. The Redskins are camping tonight. They won't start for here till tomorrow. Twitty. All right, Captain. Now, listen. I'm telling you, keep the men inside the stockade. Won't do no good running all through the woods, leaving Boonesboro unguarded. We got to hold the fort. But you they're understand? on the warpath. I'm a going. Where? Where are you going, Captain? I'm going out of here tonight. I'm going to talk to the Indian chief, Blackfish. I'm going to see if you listen to me instead of the British. It's been peaceful right here at Boonesboro up to now. I know Injuns. They ain't men to attack for no reason. Someone's lying and putting them up to it to drive us out of King Tuck. And I tell you, Twitty, remember this. We got a fight now as never before for our rights. <laughs> Grandpa, tell us about the engines mm. now. I'm aiming to have a look at that likeness of me, so I'm coming over to see it, stranger. Don't move, Colonel Boone. I'll turn the easel around for you. Well, do I look like that? Well, when it's done, you may look a little like it. Now, if you will turn his head just a bit more to the right, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. This way, Grandpa. Uh, a little more. Mm. Uh, uh, now hold it. Uh -huh. Grandpa's been painted before by the Indians. He lived with them, didn't he, Grandpa? Yes, yeah, that's right, Becky, but they never painted me like the strangers are doing. Maybe the stranger would like for you to tell him about the bullet. Yeah, drive, huh? I can tell you about that. Yeah, it was a trick, of course. One day, I took the bullets out of Blackfish's gun when they weren't looking, of course, and dared him to shoot Squire at me. He did, and I pretended to catch him. <laughs> he should have seen his face. But all this must have been much later, Colonel. After you left the wedding party. Oh, no, no, no. I almost forget where it was. Yeah, I, I went to talk with Blackfish that night. After I'd walked through the woods, thinking things over, I decided I'd better be plain and speak right out what was bothering me. And I know the Indians would understand me better than they would the British. How, brother? Well, how, Blackfish? The great boon, always welcome here. But why you come see red men? Because I like Indians, Blackfish. But I was thinking there might be a sneaking white man or two here making your plan for you. Why you think white men lead war party on Boonesboro? I know they be, Blackfish. Red paint and a few feathers can't fool me. That and there's Jim's Gertie. Hey, and a red coat had become that and better than a blanket. All right, Boone. My name's Gertie. And every man, woman, and child in your fort will know it, too. I'll handle him, Jim. You think you'll stop us, Captain? That's why I'm here, if you want to know it. <laughs> you ain't got much time, Boone, if you aim to stop us. Reckon we ain't, but I uh, got time to tell Blackfish and the Shawnees you're a trickin' them, Gertie. Don't believe him, Blackfish. What do you mean, trick, brother? I'm a meanin' the English are using the engines, Blackfish, in a war against us free people. Won't do, Boone. You have no right to settle here. The king intends the land on this side of the mountains for the Indians. So listen, Boone. He speak truth. Listen, Blackfish, that ain't the truth. They mean free for Canuck fur traders. But this land belonged to the Indians, and we bought it fire and square of them. Talking about it ain't going to do any good, Boone. You're a goner, and your fort's lost. Ain't it going to be as easy as you think, Gertie? How many rifles you got in this party? A uh, hundred and twenty. Too bad. 
There's 200 at the port. You're lying, Boone. Listen, Blackfish. They want to burn Boonesboro and drive us, your friends, from our homes in winter. Don't listen to them, Blackfish. Remember, there's a reward for Boone. Let's burn the port and take him back to Detroit with us. Blackfish will not burn Boonestown in winter. We come back in spring. We take Boone, go see Colonel Hamilton at Detroit. I have spoken. Ah, Blackfish. So this is the famous Captain Daniel Boone. Understand you're the famous hire buyer, Colonel Hamilton. <laughs> I'm paying more for rebels with their hair on than for scalps, Captain. Blackfish, why didn't you burn down Boone's brothers, I told you? No. It's winter, brother. Bad for women, children, rot. Hmm, perhaps it would be easier with Boone here in Detroit. There must be no mistake this next time. You may have more than earned your 20 pounds in that case. You speak truth. Boone worth five men. Well, I've got Boone here in Detroit. We'll attack the fort. Blackfish, I'll pay you well for Boone. 50 pounds sterling. No, I no want to sell Boone. 100. Boone, fine hunter, brave man. I make him my son. Boone worth 100 men. Looks like you lost, Colonel. Reckon you'll have to allow me to go along with Blackfish. Go ahead and find your home with the Shawnees, Boone, because you won't have a home at Boone's but along. We're going to make an example of your settlement. You can't keep us penned behind the mountains to doom the day, Colonel. Americans need elbow room, and we aim to get it. Boone, when we caught you last night, you trying escape? Well, maybe I were, maybe I weren't, Blackfeet. I have warned many times, Boone. You, one of our tribe, my son. Next time, Braves kill you. If you see me, Blackfeet. Boone, you no escape all the way to Boonesboro. Seven days' journey. You find woodsman, but we catch you. Easy. You wait. We go Boonesboro soon. That's what I figured, Blackfish. From the drums. Hamilton, make us send war pipe to Mingos and Delawares. Too late for you, say, Fort. Well, too late today, anyway. I warn you last time, Boon. My own tomahawk kill you first. take over the watch, Walker. All right, Twitty. I ain't seen a sign of nothing today. Nothing, you say? Look. Stagging inside that tree. Redskin. Uh, let me get a beat Wait in. a minute. Something mighty strange about that Indian. You keep him covered. Yeah? Just a minute. He's holding up his hand. Hold your fire, Twitty. It's Stan Boone. Come home from the dead. Jemima! Mrs. Calloway! Everybody come running! Daniel Boone, come home! Daniel hey, Boone! Stop all you yelling, boy. Open the stockade. Oh! Oh! Come on. Oh, Ma's all right, Ma. Don't you worry. Here, Captain. Drink some of this, if you can. Jemima, where's Rebecca? No smoke in that cabin. Where is she? Ma went back to Carolina, Pa. She thought you was dead. We all did. You see, Captain, I scouted for you and found nothing but engine signs. We were oh, certain... Never mind now. Rebecca's safer in Carolina. Quick, Twitty, how many rifles have you? I've got 50 riflemen at the port now, Captain. Don't you worry. Worry. We ain't got time to worry. We're facing the dangest British attack you ever heard of. Now get busy, all you boys. Get to work on the stockade. We'll need new blockhouses. If we got time to build them, drive the stock inside the walls. I tell you, they'll be here any minute. If we're ever going to hold King Chuck, we've got to fight to hold it now. <laughs> That's how it was, stranger. I got back to Boonesboro in time. We saved the fort. We fit them for ten days. And one night, they quit. 
sneaked away after dark. And they didn't come back, did they, Grandpa? No. The next day, we dug 125 pounds of lead out of the stockade. It was the worst engine and British attack Kentuck ever saw. But it was the last. Kentuck was a dark and bloody ground. But we held it at Boonesboro. Uh, tell me, uh, Colonel Boone, do you ever see blackfish again? No, I never did see blackfish after that strategy. Count of how he was killed in the siege. Whatever, uh, whatever happened to all the land you staked out in Kentucky? Well, stranger, I never bothered to find out. Too many people followed me into Kentuck. No elbow room. So uh, I moved on two or three times. Now they're even following me here to Missouri. Well, in that case, Colonel, uh, maybe you'd better push on further west. Well, that's just what I've been thinking, stranger. But for a man well over 80, I ain't got too many moves left. A couple of seasons ago, I went out to the Yellowstone. Danged if I won't be there soon. I, you know, I'd sort of like to see what's hid behind them Rocky Mountains out there, too. Must be elbow room in California, yeah. California A is a mighty long way off, Colonel. It'll be a whole generation before America reaches the Pacific, I'm afraid. <laughs> Don't you be thinking that, stranger. America weren't meant to be a hemmed in by no Mississippi River and the Rockies, neither. When I started down the wilderness road in 75, it was a mighty small country. Look at it now. It growed all over the place. I reckon most folks is like me. They're all looking for elbow room. And mighty soon they'll be spread clear to the Pacific. Tell me, Colonel Boone, were you ever lost? Well, stranger, can't rightly say that they were lost, but once for three days, I was mighty bewildered. When America moved west, Daniel Boone led America. Wherever he went, people seemed to follow. He was the frontiersman, and his fame was worldwide at his death in 1820. His legend is the common property of every American and has been immortalized in Lord Byron's poem, Don Juan, in these lines. Of the great names which in our faces stare, the General Boone, backwoodsman of Kentucky, was happiest among mortals anywhere. Daniel Boone typified the eternal pioneering spirit of Americans, and tonight he takes his rightful place in the cavalcade of America. John McIntyre. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you've enjoyed our story tonight and that you will enjoy the story we bring you from the wonder world of chemistry. There was once a man named Sam Winslow who said he could make salt in a way that had never been discovered before and supply it to people more cheaply. A general court in Boston, impressed by Winslow's story, gave him the exclusive right to make salt by his method for ten years and prohibited anyone else from making salt the same way during that time. That was the first patent ever issued in America, 299 years ago in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. It hadn't anything to do with the United States patent system as we know it today, but the basic idea is the same. That idea is to encourage the genius of the inventor by giving him an opportunity to profit from his labor for a specified length of time. This month marks the 150th birthday of the United States patent system, for on April 10th, 1790, President George Washington signed the law that has helped so much to give better things for better living to millions of Americans. More than that, our patent system is one of the foundation stones of democratic government. It offers the same protection, the same opportunity, 
the same hope of reward to every individual. It's as democratic as an American institution. With his gift for a striking phrase, Abraham Lincoln said that the American patent system adds the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. And Honest Abe had good reason to know, for he was an inventor himself. While he was congressman from Illinois, he received a patent for a device to help boats through shallow water. The model of Lincoln's invention was whittled out of wood by his own hands. And you can see it on display at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., among other well, many well-known people who invented things on the side was Mark Twain, the famous humorist, who took out three patents, one of them for a self-pasting scrapbook. But such examples are merely curiosities. And although the patent office in Washington is full of amusing stories and strange machines, its true importance is shown by such inventions as McCormick's Reaper, Morse's Telegraph, Mergenthaler's Linotype Machine, Bell's Telephone, the Wright Brothers' Flying Machine, and Edison's Incandescent Lamp. Edison, during his lifetime was awarded 1,101 patents. As new products have been invented, countless new jobs have been created. For example, the recent development of nylon by DuPont chemists after many years of research made necessary the construction of a large plant. And when the workmen finished building the plant, about 850 new jobs were filled in the little community of Seaford, Delaware. In this way, American inventions have played a big part in building America, as well as creating the American way of life which provides comforts and happiness for many instead of a few, which is the spirit of the DuPont Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. And now the Cavalcade of America's historian, Dr. Frank Monahan of Yale University. There is a time when every one of us is called upon to make a decision, a decision great or small, an act that will cut or repattern the threads of destiny. Few can realize the momentous decision that faced Robert E. Lee on the verge of the tragic war between the states. Lee was a man of peace. He believed that if forbearance and wisdom had been practiced on both sides, there would have been no national tragedy in 1861. When he was offered the command of the Union Army, he declined because of his higher loyalty to his native Virginia. Lee's military genius prolonged a bitter and hopeless struggle, but after Appomattox, he devoted himself to the great task of peaceful reconstruction. Next week, Cavalcade salutes the memory of Robert E. Lee, whose fame transcends geographical boundaries and whose generous spirit has been fused into the best of America today. Our next broadcast of the Cavalcade of America will come to you from the stage of the mosque, the great showplace of Richmond, Virginia. There, in commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the surrender of the Confederacy at Appomattox, and in the home city of the South's most heroic and beloved figure, we will present the distinguished actor of stage and screen, Philip Merivale. The drama is an original radio portrayal of General Robert E. Lee. Our story is based on the Pulitzer Prize-winning biography, R. E. Lee, by the distinguished American author and editor, Douglas Southall Freeman. The orchestra and original musical effects on the Cavalcade of America are under the direction of Don Voorhees. This is Basil Risedale saying good night and best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company.